أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبيه الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد so we are continuing our series and looking at the idea of supplication and du'a to Allah Azza wa Jal and we are we continue our journey through different passages of the Quran today's passage we want to look at Surat Al-Qasas which is the 28th chapter of the Quran in which Allah shares the story of Musa and there are two major portions of the surah that touches on different eras in the life of Bani Israel and Musa salam. But I want to highlight the dua that we're going to look at is verse 24 of Surah Al-Qasas. So chapter 28, verse number 24. It's an incredible supplication, an incredible dua. We learn so much and we will gather some insights from this particular uh, these particular choice of words on behalf of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. So the idea I want to share with you and the thought I want you all to think about prior to sharing the story is that there is an Arabic expression لسان الحال أصدق من لسان المقال and there's different versions of that لسان الحال أنطق من لسان المقال this expression talks about two things. There is something called in Arabic, lisan ul-hal, the tongue of hal. Hal is your circumstance, your situation. And the opposite of that is lisan ul-maqal, the tongue of maqal. Maqal comes from the word qala, yaqulu, to say, to speak. So what does that mean? It means that the words or expressions that come out from your heart are always more eloquent, more truthful than the words that come out of your tongue. Because the words that come out of your tongue, you can make them up, you're not always truthful. How many human beings are truthful in their speech? We assume many of us are, we hope many of us are, but not everyone is. So you can say things from your mouth and not mean them. But the words that come out of your heart, from your circumstance, in Arabic we call, we call it lisan al-hal, it's always more precious, it's always more truthful than lisan al-maqal. How does this apply to dua? We mentioned last week that the dua is, is supposed to come from your heart. The dua that comes from your heart is not like the dua that comes from a piece of paper that you're reading off and that you don't understand. Because that violates the spirit of du'a, that violates the spirit of supplication. So this is a very important uh, idea, an important expression, lisan al-hal asdaqu min lisan al-maqal. There are situations where we find ourselves in and we are overcome by emotion, perhaps we're experiencing tragedy, um, it's something that overwhelms our life and our circumstance. In those moments, our hearts speak. Sometimes our tongues speak from our heart. Those moments are very different for, from when you're not feeling anything. You're trying to force yourself to do something. You're not feeling maybe the worship. You're not feeling the dua. So you look at a piece of paper or you just the memorized duas. You say them, but they're not coming from your heart. How often, and I'm in this situation like all of you, how often are we making dua or making adhkar and salah and we forget what we're saying? I forget what rak'ah I'm in. I forget the supplication sometimes in Ramadan or in Laylatul Qadr or not, like we're making dua and you just forget where you're at for a moment in time. So words are coming out of your mouth and they're not coming from your heart. So. In dua, the trick is to make lisan al-hal congruent with lisan al-maqal. The words that come out and expressed on your tongue should match the emotion and the feeling that's in your heart. 
So this is very, very important. So the story we're looking at is the story of Musa. To summarize the story before we get to this particular verse, this is a verse where Allah says, well, let's look at our verse first. فَسَقَى لَهُمَا ثُمَّ تَوَلَّى إِلَى الظِّلِّ فَقَال So Musa سَقَى لَهُمَا He watered their flocks for them. He provided water to the two of them. فَسَقَى لَهُمَا ثُمَّ تَوَلَّى إِلَى الظِّلِّ Then he retreated to find some shade and he sat down in the shade فَقَالَ and he said the following words. What were the words he said? What dua did he make? رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ This is not one of the du'as that we memorize or we say because it's very strange du'a. The words, the way they're constructed are very strange. They're not typical. Typically you say, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا something. Right, like last week, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا Oh Allah, give us in this life hasana. But this du'a is very different. The way the words are constructed, the way it comes out is very different from a usual du'a. And the backstory of this is that, as you can recall, the beginning of the surah, Allah shares the story of Musa as an infant. And remember, there was a decree to kill all male-born child, children of Bani Israel. And somehow Musa escaped. Musa was not killed. His mother put him in a basket and put him in the river now. And then he was rescued from that and then he found his way into the palace. And then he was raised among Fir'aun. They found the baby and the wife of Fir'aun didn't want to. They knew it was uh, from Bani Israel, but they, she convinced Fir'aun to not kill that baby, but to raise him in the palace. And then the long story in the palace, no, one, no woman was able to feed him. And then Allah made the mother of Musa return as a servant to the palace to feed her own child. So it's a long story and eventually Musa leaves the palace. And then Musa, uh, in his fit for, in his passion for justice, he uh, gets involved in an altercation. And he strikes one of the parties in that altercation and he kills them accidentally. <coughs> so he kills them or he kills him, and then somehow word of that spreads, and then the authorities find out. And then the next day there's a commotion, and everyone starts looking for Musa. He's the one who killed that person yesterday. And then a person comes to Musa and informs him that the authorities found out what you did, and they have issued the death penalty for you. So they are coming to find you and they will execute you. So Musa in that state, he runs, he flees, he tries to escape that land. So Musa escapes, he runs, he's, he's hunted, he's on the run. So he leaves that entire region behind and he goes into, we know the story, the, the area of the story is the Sinai Peninsula. So somewhere in the Sinai Desert. You know, because it's currently between Egypt and Palestine. In that desert, he escapes the region of Egypt and he finds a well of water. And he comes to the well of water, he finds so many people uh, getting water from that water hole or water well. It was probably a watering hole. And there are two women standing to the side and they're not being involved in the water because they're a little shy and there are all these powerful men they're getting water uh, from the well and then he asked them and they you know what's the matter with you two Jazakallah khair uh, speaking of getting water um, then they, they revealed to Musa that we're a little shy these people were waiting till they're done so we can get water so Musa helps them out he provides water to the two of them فَسَقَالَهُمَا That brings us to this verse. فَسَقَالَهُمَا ثُمَّ تَوَلَّى إِلَى الظِّلْ So he provides water to the two of them. Then he retreats to the shade. And he sits down and he says these words that are لِسَانُ الْحَالِ They come from his heart. 
So in that moment, just think about where Musa is at that point in time in his life. So he is on the run. He is hunted. Um, he left his homeland. He left his family behind. He left the place that it was, he was uh, raised in. Um, so he left everything behind and he has no idea where he's going. And he is desperate. He has no idea where to go, what to do. He just left everything behind. I mean, that's a very difficult circumstance to think about. Um, imagine you just leave everything behind and take nothing with you. Unfortunately, it's a circumstance many people find themselves in. They have always have, and, and even in today's time, look at people around the world that are refugees, people in difficult circumstances, they leave everything behind. And the only what they have is the clothes on their back and maybe something in their pocket. So that's a terrible situation to be in. So in that moment, he finds some shade. فَتَوَلَّا إِلَى الظِّلْ Why does he find some shade? You know, when we read these verses, you have to kind of put yourself in that area to understand what's happening. And sometimes we don't imagine, we can't imagine um, what does it mean to find shade, shelter and shade. You know, you really have to be in that region, that part of the world to understand the significance of that. Um, us growing up in the U.S. and myself included, we don't really appreciate what shade is until you travel. I was recently, as I told you last week, in Hajj. And we witnessed some of the most uh, tough circumstances in Hajj. Um, almost 1,400 people, the official numbers, passed away because of uh, complications from the sun. The sun in that region, in the arid desert, is so intense, you cannot stand in the sun. In the U.S., it doesn't matter. Shade, sun is almost the same for us. But in the arid desert climate of the Sinai, of Arabia, of, of Sham, that region, any place there you have the desert, the difference between the shade and the difference between the sun is the difference between life and death. It really is the difference between life and death. Standing in the sun versus standing in the shade just a few inches away is literally the difference between life and death. In Hajj, we were walking around doing the manasik, it was 120 degrees. And everywhere you find from structures, from buildings, from bridges, when there's shade, you find hundreds of people sitting in that shade. And just where the shade ends, there's not a single person. There's so many uh, poor people who have no shelter, who have no tents, who have no hotels, and they're living under these bridges. Many of these people who passed uh, were people who were in those circumstances. Um, we saw people collapsed on the street, we saw dead bodies, all because of heat exhaustion, heat stroke, all complications relating to the sun. Because the sun is intense. In midday, you know, 11, 12 o'clock, the heat of the sun is so intense, it, it, it creates changes in your body. It makes you tremendously tired. And you don't even realize that it's happening until it's too late. So many of these people, they're walking outside and they don't realize they're feeling anything and then they just collapse. So this was midday. If you look in the books of Tafsir, this was in the midday. So Musa provides water to them and in the heat of the sun he finds shelter in the shade and he's sitting under a tree. And when you come into the shade, literally it's like relief. When you come from the sun into the shade, it literally is it's a breath of fresh air. You, you get life back into your body. So in that moment, he sits down and he makes his dua. So, Musa is vulnerable. Musa left everything behind. But he makes, his, uh, makes this supplication, this dua. He says, فَقَالَ رَبِّي إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ Literally, it means, my Lord. I am, and I'll do it literally, because there are many ways to translate. It's a not a typical sentence or structure or expression. So many of the translations, they basically say, I am truly in great need of any good that you might send down to me. Right? So this is one translation, but it's, it's off. So this translation says, my Lord, I am truly in great need of any good that you might send down to me. So just think about that. That's, that's the, the sense 
of the meaning but what Musa actually says inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqeer he changes the sentence around and that will teach us so much gives us so much insight into what dua is supposed to be so he says my lord I am for whatever you send down of good in great and desperate need. So this is the order of the words here. So what can we learn from this supplication? Number one. Number one, this supplication came from Musa's heart. It's not a standard way of saying things. It just, his heart expressed these words straight from the depths of his soul. So that's the first insight, first lesson we learn from here. Dua is meant to be like that. Dua is meant to be your intimate communication with Allah Azza wa Jal. It's supposed to come from your heart. It's supposed to come from your emotion. You're supposed to feel it. So I wanted the adab of dua, ilhahu fi dua. Ibn al-Qayyim speaks about that at length. Ilha is making dua sincerely and really meaning it. Those who really need, like someone who's in great need, in a desperate situation, like someone who's a refugee, the uh, brothers and sisters in Gaza, when they make dua, that's a whole different level than when we make dua in our privileged circumstances. So Musa made this uh, dua from the, from the bottom of his soul, from the depths of his heart. That's lesson number one. The second lesson that we learn from here is that if you look at the way he said these words, there's a great Mufassir from Tunisia, Ibn Ashur, Rahimahullah, who is a tremendous, brilliant Mufassir. When he does tafsir, he looks at the insights and reveals like insights about the language and structure. So he said about this dua that he said, This is a dua, Hadihi Jumlatun Jami'atun li Shukri wa Thana'i wa Dua. This compound expression that Musa uttered, it's so comprehensive, it contains within these words a shukr, the idea of gratitude, a thana, the praise of Allah Azza wa Jal, and dua, supplication. So Musa is making dua, but within that dua you find these components. So the first thing, shukr, where is the shukr? So to understand this dua, let's understand what Musa is asking for. He's asking for blessing and khayr in his life. So one way of saying that is, Oh Allah, give me good. Right? We can say it that way. Oh Allah, give me khayr. Oh Allah, uh, I need blessings in my life. I need some good in my life. I'm in trouble, I need some good in my life. That's one way of saying it. So Musa, he says, Rabbi, inni, so, Rabbi, inni, Lima anzalta anta ilayya min khair. So if you see in the dua, he's putting Allah first. Musa is asking for khair, right? So there, in the dua, there's different components. There's Allah, the one you're asking from. There's you, right? Musa, the person who needs something. And then there's his circumstance, which is that he has no shelter, no place to go. He's hunted, persecuted, left everything behind, nothing to eat. And some tafsir, they revealed that even he had no shoes. From all that walking, he lost his shoes. He's barefoot, he's hungry, he has nothing. So the, the, the components in this dua, you have Allah, you have Musa, and you have Musa's desperate need. So what would you highlight when you have a situation like that? We might say, um, you might highlight your desperate status. Right? You might say, I am in so much trouble. Ya Allah, help me. So you start out with your need. With your... In these words, the word for need is faqir. Look at the dua. Where is the word for, uh, for need? Musa's need. His need. Where is it in the supplication? Rabbi inni. Where? At the end. Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqir. The last word is faqir. So Musa puts his need last, and what is the first word? Rabbi. He puts Allah first, and he puts his need last. This shows you, you know, who he was. He was a prophet of Allah. And this is his insight. 
believers always put Allah first and they put themselves secondary. So he began the dua by saying Rabbi. Rabbi is a tremendous expression. So you can say, Ya Allah, give me good. But when you say Ya Rabbi, Rabb means my caretaker. Rabbi means my caretaker, my sustainer. When you use the word Rabb, it's something very special. In the Quran, you have about 195 instances where this kind of dua appears. Rabbi or Rabbana, all the different... Um, one day I counted, I was doing research, I counted, and I'm probably off, maybe it is a more accurate represent, but 100, I counted 195 occurrences in the Quran of Rabbana or Rabbi, my Lord or our Lord. That tells you something, that tells you this is a great way of asking Allah. Like, not just use His name, not just say, Ya Allah, but you highlight His Rububiya. You highlight the fact that he is the caretaker, he is the sustainer, he is the source of good, he is the source of blessings, he is the source of rahmah, he is his provider. Rabbi literally means sustainer or provider, or cherisher or sustainer, or the one who raises you. Like master is also Rabb, the one who raises you is, and that's why when you raise your children, what do you call that? It's from the same word, tarbiya. Tarbiyah is when you raise your children properly. It comes from the same word. Rabba means to raise. So he started with the word Rabbi. So he put Allah first. And he highlighted Allah's, what Allah does for us. His status as our caretaker. As the provider of mercy, the provider of good. So that's a great insight in dua. Like in dua we should put Allah first. In dua, we should highlight Allah's mercy upon us and the fact that Allah takes care of us. Uh, and one great way of doing that is using the word Rabb. Ya Rabbi. Rabbana. That's why so many duas begin with Rabbana. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, like last week. So, where is the shukr here? As Ibn Ashur said, this dua contains shukr as well. So now Musa, if you look at think about this, he said, uh, Ya Rabbi. What's the next? Oh my Lord. He didn't say give me good. He didn't say I am in need first. He said, in me I am lima anzalta ilayya. For whatever you have sent down upon me. So he's highlighting the blessings that he enjoyed from Allah. Azawajal. You might think someone in that state, he lost everything. What are the blessings to highlight? You can always find something in your whatever circumstance you find yourself in, the the mercy and the ni'mah, the blessings we enjoy of Allah are always far more numerous than the difficulties we're in. Always. If you were to count the blessings of Allah, you can never enumerate them, never count them. So what were the blessings? Ibn Ashu says, for instance, Musa was raised in the palace. He got a good upbringing in the royal palace at a time when all of his, you know, the people from his race were killed. Not only did he survive, Allah saved him, but Allah raised him in the palace. Not only did Allah raise him in the palace, but Allah protected him from the evil of the palace. So he was raised in the palace, but he didn't become Fir'aun. He didn't become one of Fir'aun's men. So Allah protected him from the evil and the false beliefs of Fir'aun. Not only that, Allah saved him, uh, Allah reunited him with his mother. Allah uh, helped him escape the palace. Eventually he left the palace. He's, there was a purpose for him being in the palace to be raised. And when that purpose was fulfilled, he left. He wasn't stuck there for the rest of his life. When he left, you know, he found himself in all these circumstances. He was reunited with his people, with his family for a period of time. And then... You know, there was a death penalty upon him. He escaped that. So there's so many blessings in his life. And we know for sure that Musa must have, when he felt the coolness of the shade, and he, the life comes back to his soul, and he's sitting there, the first thing he highlights in the, in the dua are all the blessings that he enjoyed. Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin. Oh my Lord, all that good that you have sent down. Anzalta is past tense. You might say, well, he's asking for good right now. 
Yes, but he uses the past tense, that's why the translations are not so accurate. Anzalta means you have sent down already. My Lord, all the blessings you have already sent down upon me from goodness, all that you have already sent down upon me of goodness, I am in desperate need. So Musa is highlighting the good that he already enjoyed, everything Allah already sent down upon him. And then at the end he says, I am in need of that. So that's gratitude, that's shukr. So the dua contains gratitude. So that's lesson number three, I guess. Uh, I lost count, but I think we're at number three. Lesson number three is, in our dua we're supposed to be grateful. We include this attitude, we include Allah's blessings that we enjoy. And then thana, the second thing Ibn Ashur said, the dua contains thana. Thana is praising Allah for what He gives to us. So in the same expression, inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin. That's an indirect praise of Allah. All that you have given me of good, Ya Allah. That's praising Allah. That's acknowledging everything that Allah sent down in terms of goodness in his life. So praising Allah must be a part of our dua. Saying alhamdulillah or praising him in various ways. It doesn't have to be exact word. It's not the word that is important. It's the idea and the concept. So in our dua, we can begin by saying Alhamdulillah or uh, Inna Alhamdulillah or so on and so forth. Here, it's the same concept but the word Hamd is not being used. So it's not the words that are important, it's the concept that's important. So shukr and thana is an important element of dua. You know, putting Allah first as we mentioned. And now, another element here Musa could ask for, like many of us do, Ya Allah, give me a place to stay. Ya Allah, give me some food. Ya Allah, give me shoes. Ya Allah, give me this, this and this. But what does Musa ask for? He makes it so general and ambiguous. He says khair. Khair, goodness. What does that mean? That means being, sometimes being non-specific in dua is a virtue. I think we highlighted that last week as well. Being non-specific kind of acknowledges that Allah knows better than us. Ya Allah, help me out. Instead of, oh Allah, give me a six-figure salary, give me this or give me this particular job I'm looking for or this particular thing I'm trying to get. It might be good for you, but it might not be. We don't know. Allah knows. So if you put it if you trust in Allah, to so acknowledge that ambiguity and that lack of knowledge on your behalf, so you ask in general, Ya Allah, I am in need, help me out. Ya Allah, give me khayr from wherever it comes. Ya Allah, give me a job, whether it's this one or a better one. So this is what he did, khayr bin khayrin. So being non-specific is, um, is part of um, part of du'a, is part of the adab of du'a. Doesn't mean you, don't, you have to be non-specific. These are things that like Musa did and they just increase the power of du'a. It does not mean that it is not allowed for you to ask for specific, specific things. Of course we can ask for specific things. There's no limit to what you can ask from Allah. But this just shows you a higher state of operation. Believers, prophets, people like Musa salam, and people like our prophet wasalam, um, sometimes they would ask du'a and just put their trust in Allah and know that Allah is in charge and just asking Allah to shower His blessings upon us wherever they may be, wherever they may come from. So Ibn Ashul says, فَعَرَّضَ بِالدُّعَاءِ وَلَمْ يُسَرِّحْ بِالسُوَالِ He asked Allah for goodness but he didn't specify the exact details of that. So that's important because many of the prophets used to do that. There, Ibn Ashur shares some of the other prophets. For instance, Ayyub alayhi salam. Remember Ayyub, the prophet who went through so much afflictions and disease and things like that. What did he, what is his dua in the Quran? Inni masaniya durru wa anta arhamur rahimin. He asked Allah, he told Allah, Ya Allah, I am afflicted so much and you are arhamur rahimin. That's it. He didn't ask, oh Allah, cure me for the illness, bring my family back, give me this, give me that, give me that. He said, Ya Allah, you know all the afflictions I have and you are full of mercy. So the same idea that 
being non-specific, trusting Allah, alluding to His mercy and letting Him take care of things. Yunus alayhi salam in the belly of the whale. What did he say? La ilaha illa ant, subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. There is no uh, one worthy of worship but you. So glory be to you, far above in perfections is you. Inni kuntu min al-zalimeen, I have wronged myself. Just very general. He's in the belly of the whale. Instead of asking Allah, save me from here. This is what he asked. This has, this, these are the words that come out. Because they include that. So, this is an amazing way Musa made dua. Ya Allah, for all that you have sent down upon me of goodness, I am in desperate need. And the last thing he mentions is the need. I am in desperate need. Faqirun. So this we can learn so much from the way his heart operated and the way the words came out of his mouth um, and the way this dua is constructed. It is so eloquent and there's so much more that can be said about this particular dua. So it's powerful, powerful words from someone who is in such vulnerable circumstances, someone who is in such desperate need. But these are the beautiful words and the way they come out of his mouth. Alayhi um, salam. Now, the final part you can tell how amazing this dua was, how powerful it was when you look at the next few words, the next few verses in the Quran because then Allah continues the story. The story doesn't end there, but Allah continues the story by sharing with us how that dua was answered. What's the very next thing? So as soon as he made that dua, there's no gap, there's no pause, there's no other part of the story, then it comes back to a happy ending immediately. The very next verse. فجاءت إحداهما تمشي على استحياء قالت إني إن أبي يدعوك ليجزيك أجر ما سقيت لنا. So one of the much later, one of the uh, sisters came, and she said to him, "My father is calling you. He wants to reward you for the good that you did for us." So immediately Allah sends the sister and Musa knows this is from Allah. He made that dua from the bottom of his heart. And now here comes a sister. She's calling him to meet her father in order to reward him. So he doesn't know what he's going to get. But he knows there's some reward for him, some relief at hand. فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُ وَقَصَّ عَلَيْهِ الْقَصَصِ And then when he came to him and he revealed who he was, where he came from, what circumstance he was in. The man, the father of the two sisters, he says, قَالَ لَا تَخَفْ نَجَوْتَ مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ He says, don't worry, no more fear for you, you are safe now. You have been saved from the wrongdoing folk. So the first dua, what's the first answer to the dua? Not the first dua, the first answer to the dua is that Musa finds shelter. Musa finds shelter. So this heartfelt dua that came from the bottom of his heart, immediately Allah sends him the first answer. And that first answer is now he doesn't have to run anymore. He found peace and he found security. And that's something amazing. That's enough. That's enough of an answer for Musa alayhi But Allah is not done here. He's still going to give him more blessings. The first answer is finding refuge and then finding shelter. And then the next verse, what does the next verse say? قَالَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا يَا أَبَتْ إِسْتَأْجِرْهُ إِنَّ خَيْرَ مَنْ إِسْتَأْجَرْتَ الْقَوِيُ amin. So one of the sisters said, Oh my father, why don't you hire him? The best person you can hire is the one who is strong and trustworthy. So the second answer was what? A job. So Musa found shelter, he found peace and security. Um, and now the, the, the second or third answer, if you count that way, he found a means of employment. Now he has something to do. Now he has a way of building uh, some resources. So just think about that first. People find themselves in a circumstance. That's, that's all most people need, right? We want a place we can live in peace that's not riddled by war where our life is not in peril. 
where you know, we are safe, everyone wants safety and security in their life, and everyone wants shelter, and most of us want some means of employment. So Musa got all of those. But then Allah is not done yet. What happened next? The next verse. Allah continues. Qala inni, now the father is speaking, Uridu an unkihaka ihdabnatayya hataini. Ala an ta'jurani thamani ahijaj. Now the father says, you know what? I have an idea. I want you to marry one of my daughters, whichever one you choose. And you just have to stay here for eight years or ten years if you choose. So now Musa, what's the, what's the next answer to his dua? Musa found peace. Musa found shelter. And Musa found employment. Now Musa found a home. He found a home because once he gets married, now once, once you have a family and you get married, your house becomes a home. House is very different from a home. House is a structure. A house is where you stay. House could be a hotel, it could be a shelter, it could be a place where you're staying, you're paying some rent. But when that house is like blessed with a family, where you have a wife, you have kids, you have family members, that house is no longer a house, it's a home. It's a very, very different thing. So Musa was blessed not only with a house, but he was blessed with a home. That's why it said, Al-Baytu yahtawi al qulub wa laysa al asqaf or usqaf. He's, uh, it said that a, how, a home, al-bayt in the sense of a home, is comprised of hearts, you know, not walls. Walls create a, a house, but a home, in English you have house versus home. A house is just a physical structure. But a home is where your heart is, where your family is, where your spouse is, where your children are, where your parents are. So this is something amazing, Musa was giving, given this blessing, not only like peace and shelter, security, that would have been enough. A job, it would have been enough. But he got a home. In Arabic they say, daru darukum. Home is where you belong. So now Musa actually belongs there. Now that he marries one of the sisters, he becomes his home, he belongs there. That's something amazing. So Musa, the, 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 the way Allah answered, Everything that Musa could desire, or any human being could desire the world, Musa got at that point in time. That's why, you know, there's a hadith, it's a second tier Sahih hadith. Well, it's a, not the strongest hadith, but it's fairly acceptable. Uh, the hadith, the Prophet وسلم, he said, Arba'atu min sa'ada. There are four things that define worldly happiness. Anyone remember those four things? Four things that define happiness. Now this happiness is like happiness in this world. These are things that everyone wants. Yes? Yeah, that's, that's another hadith. But this, these four elements. Yes. What else? Okay. Health, uh, not in this particular hadith, but yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, all those are correct answers, but I'm trying to... This famous hadith, Arba'atun min sa'ada, or there's another version of the hadith, Adab al-Mufrat min sa'adatil mar. From the happiness of the human being is the following. So as the brother mentioned, al-mar'atu saliha, so a righteous spouse, righteous uh, wife, wal maskanul wasi, a spacious home. All human beings, these are worldly parts of happiness, right? It doesn't mean this is what, like, I mean, this is part of human happiness. Like, we all want a home that we can fit in, not a tight, cramped circle. al maskan al wasi' wal jar salih you want good neighbors. That's very important. Imagine you have a nice house and it's huge, but then the neighbors make your life hell. That's also very important. The neighborhood is very important, right? When you look for a home, when you look to buy a house, you look at the neighborhood first. Right? Al jaru qabla dar. That's an expression. You look at the neighbor before you look at the house. Right? So, good neighbors, spacious house, a good spouse. And the final thing, wal markabul hani. An animal that takes you place to place very fast. Or a fast car. Or good transportation. 
So if you have those, you have a righteous wife that you're happy with and vice versa, you have a spacious home, you have good transportation like a nice car, and you have good neighbors, that's everything you need in this life. There's nothing else left. That's, that's Sa'ada, and that's what Musa got. He probably got the transport too, we don't know about that from the details. Everything else is in the story. He got his home, he got his righteous spouse, and he had good neighbors. This person who raised him, who, the father of the two girls, um, he was someone who was righteous. Some of the Mufassirin say he could have been the Prophet Shu'ayb, but that's uh, speculation. It's probably unlikely Shu'ayb lived sometime before that. So in some of the accounts, people say that was Shu'ayb, but so Musa not only got all of this, he got so much more. He got this mentor, this person who was righteous. He lived with him, he learned, he became, he, he, he entered a period in his life that he went through this tremendous training. So that's the, what I wanted to say today. There's a lot more in the story, but for our purposes, look at this beautiful, heartfelt prayer that comes from the heart of Musa. Look at what we learn from the way Musa communicates with Allah Azza wa Jal. And look at how Allah answers the prayers of someone who asks Him sincerely. May Allah make all of us among those who are able to ask Allah from the depths of our heart. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. With that, any comments or questions? Yes, brother. Just I would like to add, you know, one thought came to my mind. When I was reading this dua, it's just you feel kind of humbleness from Prophet Musa alayhi salam when he is asking Allah. So he's very humble and you highlighted the aspects of being humble and putting this dua. Yeah, actually, so I should have mentioned that could be in point number six. In dua, putting that humility like making yourself broken and humble before Allah. It's called Al-Inkisaru Bayna Yadillah. So that's part of the other Dua, lowering yourself. Like last week we looked at the more you lower yourself, Allah wants you to lower yourself so He can raise you. So in Dua, the more you humble yourself, use humble language, put yourself in a humble situation and uh, express your need and express the fact that you don't know what you're doing, only Allah knows. And, all these things, the more you humble yourself before Allah, you put yourself in a broken state before Allah, that also increases the power of du'a. Jazakallah khair, that was excellent. I want to add that in my notes. Jazakallah khair. Yes, yes. That's a good question. So if um, the question is for people ask me to repeat the questions, um, the people who are watching. Um, the sister shared that when she was really desperate and asking Allah, she really needed something, asked from the bottom of her heart. It was granted to her. Now she finds herself asking Allah for things and some, she doesn't have that same intensity of feeling. So should we continue making dua if we don't have that intensity of feeling or... Um, yes, we should because that's what worship and dua is. You're not a human being, our hearts fluctuate, they're, they're not always in the same situation and state. So we're always supposed to... Um, we're always supposed to be worshiping Allah and calling upon Him. Allah wants us to make dua all the time. Uh, and salah is dua. Five times a day we make salah, which is dua. And um, if you're not feeling it, that's not an excuse for you to say, well, my heart is not into it, let me not make it. No, you still have to uh, make dua. And you ask Allah to keep your heart firm. You ask Allah to give you tawfiq. And Allah hears your prayers and uh, your heart will change. I mean, heart is something very peculiar. You, you can go from, you know, as you get older and you see more and more circumstances, realize you can go from waking up in the morning, you're so happy, 
something happens in a moment, suddenly you become full of stress and anxiety and sadness and you can see it in your face and people ask you what's going on. And you could be in that state and then suddenly you get lifted up, you see something. It could be something so simple, Allah shows you like a rainbow or some nice color or you see like grass somewhere and it just lifts your spirits and then you're just in a different mindset. That's how human beings are, our hearts fluctuate like in the wind. Um, and that's why the Prophet he would say that uh, the heart of the believer is between the hands of, the fingers of Ar-Rahman. So he would make dua for, Ya muqallib al-qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Ya Allah, the fluctuator of the heart, our hearts flip up and down in different situations, make our hearts firm on the deen. So the believer continues doing what they're supposed to do, continue making dua. If you know something is good for you, even though you're not feeling it, um, still make dua. And Allah can still give you. Allah can still give you what you ask for, even if you don't, your heart is not into it. It's just, this is part of the adab, it increases the power of your dua. But it doesn't mean that you don't have that intensity, don't make dua and Allah will not give you. So inshallah, keep hope alive that uh, Allah grants, He's al mu'ati He's the one who gives everyone, even people who may not deserve it. Actually, most people don't deserve it. We don't deserve anything in our life. No one can say, I deserve this. Every single blessing we have is blessing that we don't deserve. But Allah gives it to us, even though we don't deserve it. And so much more, He gives non-believers, disbelievers, things they don't deserve. So, why would you not call upon that person, even if, you know, you might not be in a situation? Allahu <clears throat> A'lam. Anyone else? Yes, go ahead, sis. So the, the state of broken is a good question. How do you achieve it? I mean, there are no specific steps that, um, there's no one particular program, one particular way of doing things or will put you in that state. Uh, most important thing is, um, Every day, look at Allah's blessings and look at your weakness. So there are two things you, be, you should be looking at every single day. Every single day you should be reflecting on the mercy that Allah gives us in our life. The blessings that we enjoy from Allah. And then the second part of that, remind yourself is of the fact that you don't deserve those blessings. Allah is acting out of ihsan. Like in the same surah, this chapter 28, the next story is about Qarun. And in that, Allah shares the verse says, "Wa ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk." Treat people with ihsan the way Allah treated you with ihsan. Ihsan is the opposite of adal. There's two things in Islam: adal and ihsan. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Adal is justice. Adal is you give someone what they deserve. Ihsan is to give people more than they deserve. That's the difference. Adil is whatever people deserve, you give exactly that. You have someone working for you, you pay them exactly what they're due. Not a iota more, nothing less. Ihsan is being generous, giving people much more than they deserve, giving people things they don't deserve or more than they deserve. So the people of Qarun was one of the richest people in the world and he rejected Allah. His people said to him in the same surah, they were reminding him, look, Allah blessed you with all this wealth. Um, you should treat people with ihsan the way Allah treated you with ihsan. And that's a reminder to, to Qarun that all this wealth, you are filthy rich. Allah gave you that. You didn't deserve it. Allah gave it to you out of ihsan. So you should treat other people with ihsan. So I guess... For us to be in that broken state, if you just highlight two things, Allah's blessings and, and, and favors upon us, the ni'mah, and, the, and then the second fact that all of that represents ihsan, because we don't deserve it. It's not because we deserve it, deserve those blessings, but Allah is treating us in a far better way than that we deserve. If you keep that in mind, then you realize that, you know, you, we are in need of Allah Azza wa Jalla. We are fuqara. 
we are faqir. You know, without Allah's mercy, we would not survive for a moment. So just reminding ourselves of these two things every single day, you know, the blessings we enjoy and the fact that we don't deserve them. Those are two things. That'll put us off ourselves in a situation of humility and humbleness, and that'll allow us to be in the state before Allah of humility and brokenness before Allah. Because the opposite of brokenness is standing proud. And that comes from an attitude of privilege, attitude where you feel like you deserve things, you feel like you got yourself in a situation because of what you did. So that makes you a little hum uh, arrogant. And that's what Qarun did. Qarun, when, when the people said, Ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk, what was his answer? And the next thing he says, Qala innama utituhu ala ilmin indi. He said, I am here because of my knowledge, for what I did with my life. I have these riches because of my choices. So he felt he deserved them. The people were reminding him that he didn't deserve any of those blessings. So that is the key from this particular surah. Wallahu a'ala. Yes, Anu. Yeah, I mean, dhikr in general is, is, is remembering Allah and Allah has so many attributes and He has 99 names, but far more than that. Those are just an example of, of 99 names that we know. So the adhkar are, they're built within, within the adhkar are, you know, affirmations of the power of Allah, the affirmations of our weakness before Him. Within the adhkar there are dua, supplications, when you say, Ya Arham ar rahimin just say it like that, like uh, Yunus did. But Anta Arham ar rahimin It's a dhikr, but it's also a dua. All he said is, you are the most merciful of the people who show mercy. And he didn't say, ask for anything. But that's dhikr. That dhikr includes dua. Because when you say that, when you acknowledge Allah's power and majesty and all His attributes, um, you're also acknowledging your imperfections and your need and the fact that you need the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jalla and so on and so forth. So the adhkar are multifaceted, but a dhikr is what brings life to the soul because it teaches us who Allah is, teaches who we are, teaches us our orientation, includes worship, includes dua, kind of ties everything together. That's why Allah says, Wala dhikrullahi akbar. Dhikr, remembering Allah, is truly the greatest thing truly is the greatest thing. Because everything we're talking about here, dua, that dhikr, that falls under the category of dhikr. Dhikr is remembering Allah. And that's the whole test of life. Allah wants us to remember Him through various ways. So it could be just thinking about Allah. It could be those words we utter in specific situations. It could be those supplications. It could be the salah that we make. It's taking care of our families. Everything we do out of duty to Allah. All that is part of dhikr, remembering Allah. And that's the test of our lives. We have to remember Allah in our life. Allah Amen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's an excellent question. The question is how do we protect ourselves from mindlessness in our adhkar, in our supplications. That's, that's the test of the believer. Um, and that is something everyone dealt with, even the companions dealt with that, struggled with that. Because when you do things, the, the worst thing for worship, the enemy of worship is habit. The enemy of worship is habit. What that means is that Allah wants us to worship Him, but not out of ritual or routine. Right? So, Sometimes, you know, you're doing the same thing again and again every day. And, I mean, you have to. I'm not saying don't pray five times a day and don't do these things, but you have to recognize that habitual routine, you know, makes us uh, heedless, puts us in ghafla. So we have to find ways, creative ways of breaking that cycle. Uh, you have to find things that work for you. Um, you know, in Salah, like Salah is the greatest thing we do, like the, the thing we do most frequently is Salah. 
And one of the most important qualities of Salah is khushur. Khushur means mindfulness. So Allah wants a prayer where you know what you're saying, you know what you're doing, you're pro you're, you have a presence of mind. Allah describes the believer, وَالَّذِينَ fi salatihim خَاشِعُونَ Those who in their salah they have this mindfulness, for sure. And that's the same thing with dhikr and everything else. So if you don't have that, then you kind of lose the salah. Yes, you fulfill the, the obligation of praying, but then if you didn't know what you were praying and you just were lost in thoughts, all of us experience that. But you have to fight it. There's so many different techniques and ways and that's a whole class in and of itself. Uh, and everyone, it's things, um, you know, it's different for everyone. Like for, uh, for many people, eliminating distractions, right? So, so it, eliminating distractions in worship is one key part of that. So for instance, one of the, there's so many things the Prophet taught us that all fall under this umbrella of eliminating distractions. So one of the things um, the Prophet said, for instance, La ida, I forget the exact words, when Asha and Aisha are presented to you, Asha and Aisha are presented before you, Qaddimul Asha. When Asha is dinner, Aisha is Isha prayer. So when you have both before you, you have dinner is ready and the Salah is ready, what are you supposed to do first? You're supposed to eat first. Why? Because if you don't eat first, that's going to be a distraction. While you're praying, you'll be thinking about the food. You'll be thinking about your hunger. You're supposed to eliminate your needs. So you're supposed to come to prayer like with an empty heart, an empty mind, so you're not distracted. So that's why the instruction when there's food is, is actually ready. This means when the food is actually served and ready and it's time to pray, then you should, if you have a choice. I mean, if you're in a masjid and there's a qama time, that's different. But if you have the choice, then it's better you, you eat first. And the same thing is uh, considered makru to uh, pray while you have to use the restroom. So you're supposed to use the restroom first, get rid of your body, bodily needs, so they're not distracting you. So the reason we have all of these instructions, there are many more. There are so many other things like the Prophet ﷺ one time, he was praying and there was a, a cushion that was checkered, like a curtain that Aisha had put up that was checkered. It had like colorful patterns. So after Salah, he said, uh, take this down, rip it up and use it somewhere else. Why? Because it distracted him in prayer. So eliminating distractions in prayer, uh, whether it's color colorful things and things like that. Um, so all these things are very, very important. And the main idea here is what are you trying to do with all of these instructions? The, the higher value, the greater thing we're trying to achieve is trying to eliminate distractions so we can be focused in our prayers. So, um, there's, so that's one part of that, eliminating distractions. And part of that is making non-habitual and non-routine. So you should switch up your adhkar and your dua. So sometimes you make the same adhkar all the time, then you just, it becomes habit and you forget about them. So one technique would be to switch it up, to make different dua, to make uh, different uh, you know, you, 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 you switch up your adhkar, switch up your prayer. There's such a wealth of adhkar that you can make. Um, you don't have to do the exact same one. You could do the patterns like after salah, the subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa astaghfirullah, and all these. So there's 33, 33, 34. But there is a, a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet said, do 10 times subhanallah, 10 times alhamdulillah, 10 times Allahu Akbar. So maybe 10 might work better for you. And I find that for a lot of people, the number 10 works much better than 33. With 33, there's no way you're going to be focused in when you're making 33 times. You're focused on the number. When you do high number of adhkar, for instance, you're focused on the number, trying to get to 100, trying to get to maybe even higher than that. So if you do a smaller amount, like 10, then it's much easier to focus during those 10. Um, so... There are a lot of different techniques like that, imaginations and visualizations and things like that. So um, it's something all, each and every one of us will have to work on and there's no one formula for everyone. But everyone will have to every day remind ourselves that we're praying as if this is our last prayer. There's also a technique and you don't know that you're going to get this chance again. One of these prayers will be your last prayer. If you have that idea in mind, that's a powerful technique as well. One breath will be your last, 
One prayer will be your last. And you don't know. None of us will ever know when our time is up. So if you pray each prayer as if it's your last, then you're going to have much better experience and you'll be more focused, inshallah. Wallahu ta'ala a'ala. Yes. To remind myself and also the sister about her concern uh, of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah al Nisa. Ma yafa'alu Allahu bi azabikum in shakartum wa amantum. Yeah. So yeah. that's in itself just a kind of. Yeah, if you don't mind, last week some people texted me that. We would like to hear the questions from the audience. So, okay. like in the live stream, they were able to hear everything. <laughs> okay. Just to remind myself and to calm myself and the sister about her concern, the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An Nisa, verse 147 in shakartum wa amantum. The meaning, you know, I would leave this to our speakers. <laughs> yes, so shukr is the verses, Allah will never punish you, punish you if you are grateful and you believe in Allah. So uh, being grateful, shukr is really the essence. Um, the opposite of shukr is kufr. So shukr is like being grateful. And that goes back to like what I said, if you... You try to think about all the blessings we enjoy, the fact that we don't deserve them, that puts us in a state of gratitude. And you're, you're grateful to Allah for doing that for you when you didn't, didn't deserve it. So, shukr really is the key emotion. It's the key central emotion you need to have in your life uh, to build a life of belief and worship. It's really about shukr. And that's really the test. When Iblis was sent to live in the world and Allah sent Adam to live in the planet, Iblis said, give me some time. And Allah said, okay, you have until the day of judgment. Um, Iblis promised Allah, he said, I'm going to do my best to misguide human beings. I will come from their right and the left. And imani wa shama'inim wa la tajidu aktharuhum shakirin. He said, you will find in the end, I will succeed. You will find that most human beings are not grateful. They don't have shukr. So that's what shaitan is working on. His master strategy and plan is to make us ungrateful. So the key to that is when you recognize that, we have to have shukr and gratitude. That's the key. Allahu A'lam. Jazakallahu khairan. Thank you for coming out in the storm. And, uh, you know, inshallah, uh, 